Welcome to Straight Talk Tuesday. Today's Tuesday, October 13th, 2020, and this is our next installment of the Financial Wellness Series. Today we'll be covering investment fundamentals. I'm Brent Bowers, a Retirement Plan Advisor at Retirement Plans, Inc., and this presentation has been put together with Rich Myers, a Retirement Plan Advisor at Retirement Plans, Inc. So let's take a look at today's agenda. The key concepts we'll cover are understanding securities, and basic strategy and principles of investing. So let's kick it off. Let's start with understanding securities. First, let's review the type of investments or securities that are most common. Stocks are ownership in a company. So when you purchase a stock, you are basically becoming an owner of said company. Bonds is where you're loaning your money to a organization or government entity for a period of time and a certain interest rate that you would be receiving for loaning your money. And cash equivalents are similar to a savings account or money market account. Each one of these investment options or securities could play a vital role in a portfolio that you would build to achieve your investment goals. Next, let's take a look at retail versus institutional share classes. All mutual funds, regardless of they're made up of stocks or bonds or both, have what's considered retail versus institutional share classes. The retail share classes will typically have commissions built into them, either on the front end when you purchase them or on the back end when you sell them. They also have what's called 12B1 or sub TA fees, which can be used to be kicked back to an advisor or to fund marketing initiatives of the fund uh, and the like. The institutional share classes have no commissions or hidden fees. They're the same investment but with lower fees because you're only paying for the actual investment management. These are what's considered best in class and would most likely be the most advantageous share class for an individual investor to be in. However, sometimes fund companies will put large minimums or high minimums on those institutional share classes. You might have to have $200,000 or more to be able to obtain them. However, your advisor may be able to get those minimums waived. So I know that's a lot to try and understand, so let's take a look at an example. Here I'm using the American Fund Small Cap World Fund. And I have the share classes listed here from A to F3. And what you'll notice here is that the management fee, which is 0.62%, is consistent across the board of all of the share classes. A and C have either a front end or back end charge. So on A, it's five and three quarters. And then you'll see listed there a 12B1 fee of 0.26% and another fee of 0.2. The difference between A and C is the, the commission is on the back end. So when you sell the fund, you would incur a 1% commission. And what they've done is the 12B1 fee is higher. So on an annual basis, you're paying higher, but your commission rate is lower than the A share class. F1, F2, and F3 do not have any commission on the front or back end. And F1 still has that 12B1 fee, which is an annual fee typically kicked back to advisors, and then another fee of 0.22%. F2 and F3 both get rid of the 12B1 fee. However, what's not shown here is F2 would be uh, applicable for sub TA fees, which could be kickbacks, whereas F3 is institutional because there's no 12B1 or sub TA fees. As you can see, F3 is your most cost efficient share class at 0.69%. Uh, out of all those share classes from A to F3. Let's take a minute to talk about active versus passive funds. So active funds is where they're actively managing the fund to try and beat an index. So you have fund managers that are, uh, you know, on a daily basis buying and selling uh, stocks and bonds or whatever the fund's uh, goal is and trying to beat the benchmark, which is their, what would be considered their peer group. So maybe they're stacked against the S&P 500 and they're trying to beat that index. Typically these have a little bit higher fees for that fund management. Um, and these are better suited for most when they're looking for better returns than indexes. And usually the most success we see is in a niche sector of investment. So like a small cap fund, typically could perform better as an actively managed than a passive fund. The passive index funds, again, these are you know lower fee funds that typically you would see, and they're usually just trying to track an index. So for example, the Fidelity 500 index is trying to track the S&P 500 um, and basically perform how the index performs. So uh, 
it's the goal really here is to provide low fees and track the index. And you typically see this uh, better for those that are looking for major sectors of investments. Um, so that's something that in a portfolio, we would see a need for both active and passive funds, depending on the type of investment and the goal that we have. Next, let's take a look at basic strategy and principles. With most things in life, the more risk that we are willing to take, the more opportunity there is for reward. Uh, you know, when we take a look at the chart to the right here, we'll start with capital preservation, which is your safest investment option. You can see there's not a lot of risk there for our, us to lose money, um, but the return on our money is not going to, it's going to be very minimal. Um, and as we move up the chain there from bonds to large cap, you know, equities, uh, mid cap equities, small cap equity, equities, and international equities, you can see our risk for potential money loss and money gain is much higher. Um, so, you know, international funds would be some of your riskier investments, but also the greatest opportunity for return. You know, there's periods of time where domestic equities will outperform international and vice versa when international will outperform domestic. Um, so it is appropriate for uh, almost all portfolios, especially for retirement considerations to have some exposure to the international. And then as would be common sense, smaller the company, the more risk there is, just because when we go through economic downturns, like we have this year, you know, small cap companies, or what we consider a small company, usually has less uh, reserves or less ability to fund themselves during periods of, you know, declining revenue uh, and things of that nature, whereas a large, more uh, established company could weather some bigger storms. And really here, the key to, you know, when you think about investing is diversification, uh, especially within your retirement portfolio. We really want to make sure we're diversified because that does a couple things for us. One, it reduces our risk. So the more diversified we are, uh, the less risk that we're going to be able to undertake, as well as for during periods of time when certain sectors of the market outperform. So say international is outperforming domestic, domestic equities for us, uh, we have exposure there. So really we want to be able to diversify to reduce our risk and also have exposure to different areas of the economy for when one area would outperform another. Quick financial fact here, Social Security benefits uh, in retirement will typically account for no more or at most 40% of your pre-retirement income. So let's take a look at the importance and implications of saving for retirement outside of Social Security. We'll look at the illustration here to the right, starting with Michael, who started saving at age 35, contributed for 32 years at about $200 a month with a 7% hypothetical growth rate and a total contribution of 96,000 at retirement age of 67 had $342,000 saved. Ashley, on the other hand, started saving earlier at age 21, and she only contributed for 14 years to stopping at age 35, saving the same amount per month at a 7% growth rate, and a total contribution of 42,000 ended up with $610,000 at retirement age of 67. This is because she was able to start saving earlier, and although she saved for less time, she gave her money the opportunity to compound and work for her, being able to be invested for a longer period of time. Lastly, Courtney was able to start saving at age 21, but she saved up until the age of 67. So for 46 years, she put in about $200 a month, making total contributions for her at 138,000. And at the age of 67, she had obtained $950,000 in savings. This is more of the ideal scenario we'd like to see for most is to be able to start saving early and save up until retirement. So I know we threw a lot at you today and hopefully you found it valuable information as I think it's important for every investor to understand these questions and, and different intricacies of the investing world when talking to your advisor. If you have any questions about your current retirement savings or just your savings in general, please feel free to reach out to Rich Myers or myself, Brent Bowers. We'd be happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you for taking the time to tune in to this uh, session of Straight Talk Tuesday on our financial wellness series. And I look forward to talking with you next month.